it's my contention that, or my definition that, architecture is a manifestation and form of a culture's worldview. And we're going to see throughout this course how that is manifest. What we're going to do in the course, we're going to have about, uh, next week we're going to talk about culture, and then we're going to do about five weeks of different cultures. And then the rest of the course will be discussion and theory and projects. And here's a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright. I believe in God, I'll I spell it nature. God is the great mysterious motivator of what we call nature, and it has been, it has often been said by philosophers that nature is the will of God. And I prefer to say nature is the only body of God that we shall ever see. The mother art is architecture. Without an architecture of our own, we have no soul of our own civilization. So that's a pretty mystical, spiritual view of architecture by a major architect. And now let's, uh, well, okay, but what about Mies van der Rohe, architect of glass and steel? Mies says, architecture is the real battleground of the spirit. Architecture depends on its time. Architecture is the crystallization of its time's inner structure, the slow unfolding of its time's form. So that's Mies, who we are maybe tempted to think of as a functionalist architecture. He's anything but. He's a totally mystical architecture, and he sees the uh, spirit of our time manifest in this glass and steel architecture. How many people know this book? How many people had Delanda last semester? How would you describe Delanda's approach? Materialist. Material. Material. So Delanda is a materialist. In other words, cultures are determined by their material circumstances, resources, type of agriculture, trade, rivers, ports, etc. And that point of view is very strongly expressed by... So the most famous recent expression, the most prominent recent expression of that point of view is Jared Diamond. He's got a new book, uh, but the famous one is Guns, Germs, and Steel in which he says cultures are materially based and yes but they're also symbolic which people like diamond have no awareness of it, these people just don't know anything about art you know if you know anything about art you know there's something going on here now i'll give you an example well before we do that uh, here are four religious traditions Christianity, what, what building is this? St. Peter's, what's this? Issei Shrine, and what's the religion? Shintoism in Japan, and this is the Great Mosque of Cordoba, Islam, and this is a Buddhist stupa in Java, Indonesia. Very different architectures reflect now Yes, you know, they're going to build differently because they have different materials and stuff, but they are primarily reflective of different belief systems. So here's a little demonstration. Ancient Egypt and the Mayan are cultural twins. They both build pyramids. They both have pantheons of gods and lots of parallels in these pantheons. They both have mummies. They have brother-sister marriage of aristocracy. They have um, uh, hierarchical royalty. They both have hieroglyphs. They're both theocratic nation-states or city-states. They both have highly stratified societies. They both have dynastic successions or rulers. You won't have time to write all this down, but again, the, the slide is on the LMS. Um, they both have the typical features of statehood, including standing armies, public work programs, codes of law, taxation. They both have syncretic state religion. They both have elite priesthoods. 
They both have a cosmos as a world mountain, which is symbolized by their pyramid. They're twins. They just happen to be 3,000 years apart, and the Egyptians have wheat, bronze, the wheel, a horse, a draft animal. Mayans have corn, no bronze, no wheel, no horse, no draft animals. There are no material similarities between those two cultures. I mean, how many, no bronze and no draft animals? And no wheel? <laughs> how technologically primitive can you get? But they are cultural symbolic twins. So not knowing his history, not knowing his culture, Jared Diamond is totally going to wear this. So that's my argument for symbolic understanding of culture. Now, there's a truism. Of course, you can't build in stone if you don't have stone. That's a truism. But it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you why these cultures are symbolically twins, but technologically totally different. So I'm going to say this again and again. A culture begins by laying down its temple form and its epic poem. So let's say we got, let's say there was some, you know, disaster. And we were all that was left. And we say, okay, you know, we've got a couple of years of canned tuna in the, <laughs> in the, uh, anybody watch um, Walking Dead? For a while I could survive on canned tuna. <laughs> there are grocery stores filled with canned food. After a while that gets used up. But, and then we said, okay, let, 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 we're going to build a new civilization. And, you know, so what, what, what should our civilization be all about? Well, we work on that, we come up with something, and then we would create a temple form and an epic poem. That's how you do it. That's how they all do it. That's how you create a civilization. Cultures are symbolic entities. I'm going to go through this too quickly. This is the whole course. But we can say there are five great culture forms across the Eurasian continent. In China, I'm going to take for the epic poem, the Tao Te Ching. The idea is uh, the Tao, the Tao is the flow of all things, nature, but the cosmos as well. Typical Chinese temple is open for nature to flow through it. Human beings are integrated with nature. They are natural creatures, part of the flow of nature. And we'll take as one of our great stories, monkey, Monkey is, and we'll go into this one, monkey is an extremely rambunctious creature, a superhero. But Buddha puts an iron mountain on top of him. Uh, and he's only released to help the greater good. He doesn't freelance. Or he did. <laughs> and he knocked over things in heaven. And so he gets locked up and allowed to um, use his super strengths only to help the greater good. In India, we have Buddhism. And the point in China is to identify with the flow of all things. The point in India is this world's an illusion. The point is to identify with the transcendent infinite. And that's what Buddhism brings to us. And Within the social sphere, we conform to our given role. And that comes to us in the story of Arjuna in the Mahabharata, um, the section on the Bhagavad Gita, in which Arjuna says, I'm, I will not fight. And Krishna rears up and says, who are you? These men are already dead. You can't transcend time or fate. In the Middle East, the point is to put one's, the point is submission, and to put the society in accord with the Creator as 
revealed in the patterns of the stars or in a revealed book. And as above, so below. And we'll take as our character Job and God and the devil are in a bar and the God says to Satan, Behold my subject Job. Look at how loyal he is to me. And what does Satan say? Yeah, sure, look at all the wealth you've given him. No wonder. Take that away and see what happens. And God says, you're on. And so Satan destroys Job's home, kills his family, destroys his crops, destroys his health, uh, destroys his stature in the community. And then God appears before Job and Job says, I bow down before you. What would a modern Westerner say? You sicko! What the hell is that all about? What's wrong with you? In Greece, we have the emergence of the individual, but subject to fate. So here's the Greek temple, emerging from nature. And the individual emerging from society as the individual freestanding columns. And take our story as the story of Prometheus, who steals from the heaven not only fire, but the arts and sciences. And Zeus says, you idiot! Why does Zeus get upset? Because with these things, humans will overthrow the gods. We're going to lose our jobs. And he punishes Prometheus by chaining him to a rock. And an eagle comes every day and eats out his liver, which regrows every night. And in uh, Aeschylus is Prometheus bound. Prometheus riles against his fate, but when a delegation of gods comes and says, all you have to do is apologize to Zeus, Prometheus says, you go tell Zeus I spit in his face. So he's defiant, but resigned to his fate. Uh, we don't have Aeschylus as Prometheus unbound, but Andre Gide wrote uh, a version of that. And Hercules is hiking across the mountains, and the eagle attacks him, and he kills him. And he's dragging this giant eagle with him, and he comes to Prometheus, and he says, Oh, I'm so sorry, was that your eagle? And Prometheus says, That's okay. <laughs> And Hercules smashes the chains and frees Prometheus. In the West, they have the notion of an individual with an inner moral compass, not subject to fate. What is the ultimate fate that no one can escape? Death. What project did I describe I'm working on? Time check. And what does the client want to do? Escape death. There's some genes that make you get older. Just turn them off. You get to be 35 and you stay there for a few hundred years. Uh, what's this death thing? It's, it's, it's develop a pill already. And then, so now we've been doing this for about 15 years. Guess who just jumped in? Google. They just committed a billion dollars to their immortality anti aging project. We're still ahead of them, but a billion dollars is a lot of money. And, you know, these guys, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, they're getting older and they're saying, what's this? Well, well you know, who can fix it? You know, you got a lab, you want to fix How much you need? Ten billion? Here's a check. <laughs> I've got a hundred billion, so what's, what's the problem give you ten if it keeps me from dying? These people don't accept that fate stuff. <laughs> You know, the Earth isn't going to last forever. What's uh, Elon Musk's solution? We've got to become a multi-planet species. Let's get this Mars thing going. There's already a lot of people signed up. And they know it's going to be a one-way trip. But there are hundreds of people already signed up to go to Mars. Be, you know, they're going to be launching within 10 years. So the hell with this NASA stuff. They'll never get there. These, these billionaires are just doing it on their own. So that's these people. <laughs> I'll quickly show you what we'll cover in the course. We're going to look at Paleolithic and Neolithic because in Paleolithic, we're talking about 100,000 years of human history. Neolithic is 10,000. And then since the Industrial Revolution is only um, a couple hundred. But uh, here we have Terra Amada House.
shed roof, hearth. You ask any child to draw a house, what will they draw? So this is the Terramata house, 300,000 BCE, and I'm saying it's laying down archetypal imagery, which is with us to this day. Now, what do we notice about this date? These are not human beings. This is not Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens are 100,000 years ago. So this is even 200,000 years before Homo sapiens emerged. We already had fire, the hearth, the shed roof house. It's been embedded in there for quite a while. Um, when we look at the Paleolithic, we'll look at shamanism. Shamanism, I'm going to describe as the Ur religion. It's the fundamental basic architecture of shaman is reflected in the religions of the higher cultures. The three worlds, the upper world, this world, the lower world, uh, a whole series of uh, principles of religion are laid down in shamanism. Shamanism is in just about every, uh, whatever word we're supposed to use, primitive culture in the world. And we'll look at Neolithic, our most famous Neolithic building type is the Stonehenge, but Neolithic is beginnings of settled agriculture. The moment you have settled agriculture, you have to build permanent settlements in order to be there when the crop comes in. And then the whole thing follows from that. You get specialization, you get uh, technologies. Here we've got ceramics, metallurgy, textile, domesticated animals, already 10,000 years ago. We're still using most, much of that stuff to this day. This is uh, another key Neolithic monument, Newgrange Passage Mound in Ireland. Originally, this white quartz covered the whole thing. It's uh, suffered in 5,000 years. But, this is mound. You come in. Does this remind you of anything? Say again? Yeah. So, one of the ideas I want to convey in this course is that in these, uh, particularly in these early cultures, Basic principles are laid down which are still archetypally with us to this day. 4,000 years later, Chartres Cathedral. Nave, transept, apse. Nave, transept, apse. Nave, nave. Light box above the entrance. Rose window above the entrance. We'll go into this in more detail. But this is a basic pattern laid down by this European culture, and they are manifesting it 4,000 years later. These things hang around. Uh, then uh, next week, we'll, the two weeks, we'll also look at the Dogon. The Dogon is a good example of a tribal African culture because their culture is intact. They very cleverly located where there's no water, no gold, no uranium, and no oil. So nobody wants, is interested in taking their land. So their culture is very much intact. There's only one, oh, and this is a Dogon house. So this is a granary, but here's a house. That is that. Here are the two arms, and here's the head. So this is a Dogon house. So it's anthropomorphic, the shape of the human being. Uh, the Dogon do have one vulnerability, and that is they carve um, sculptures and doorways, and the French gallery owners swoop in every spring and buy everything up. <laughs> so they can get like 5,000 bucks for a door. And uh, they weave these great baskets, and they could buy Tupperware containers, you know, but they don't. They totally keep their culture. And we'll talk about that in two weeks. There's a very good Dogon collection in the Metropolitan Museum. Uh, Lester Wonderman uh, financed it. He's a major figure in advertising and an honorary Dogon. And they are often vendors selling African masks on the sidewalk on 53rd Street in front of the Museum of Modern Art. Some of them are Dogon, and it's not hard to recognize them.
Not a clock, son. Well, then look at pre Columbian, Mesoamerican, and South American. So, pre Columbian means the New World, North and South America, and Central America, before Columbus arrived in European colonizations. Mesoamerica is Mexico, and then South America. And we have uh, three major cultures Mayan, Aztec, and Incan, but there's a dozen cultures. And we'll just look at those three. Uh, many of them share Quaxqualto. A dying and resurrecting God, born of a virgin and associated with a cross. So one of the themes that I'm going to be addressing in this course is this notion of archetypes. How many days was Christ in the underworld before he returned? Three days. What were his experiences there? We don't know. The previous pope, about three years ago, the pope was asked about it. He says, I don't know. Uh, the Quaxacolo spends nine months in the underworld with a whole series of adventures which is indicative of a highly developed unconscious. So um, Quaxacolo is associated with the sun but also with Venus. And Venus spends nine months invisible before it comes back again so it has a totally different cycle. We'll look at Hinduism and Buddhism. So here's a Hindu temple and a Buddhist stupa, which is a three-dimensional mandala. So this is the Vasta Purusha mandala, and then we see this mandalic design becoming the plan of a Hindu temple and a Buddhist stupa as well. So this is in uh, Java, Indonesia. Um, it survived all uh, this time, it's around 900 AD. We'll look at China and Japan, and we'll look at geomancy or feng shui, which we know as, oh, you should put the door facing this way, or you should have a mirror facing that way. Feng shui in popular culture is ways to make a, a better, more spiritually flowing environment, but among Chinese, it's extremely serious. And any developer will get a Feng Shui master to look at the movement of energies on the site and orient the building properly, even if the developer doesn't believe in it. Potential tenants might. And you don't want to alienate potential tenants. So when IMP did the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong, you know, you see, where, where's the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank by IMP? Somewhere in China. Anyway, he deliberately did everything wrong <laughs> by Feng Shui. He says, I don't buy this stuff. <laughs> uh, since I brought it up, let's... Uh... So this is unfair because I could find a Chinese portrait. But this is a Chinese landscape. <laughs> There's architecture here, and there's people here. We don't spot them very easily, because they're thought of as integral with the landscape. In Western art, what's this painting? By, correct, Leonardo da Vinci, Mona Lisa. The human figure pretty well dominates the landscape. <laughs> so this, you wouldn't see this in a Chinese painting. So two different attitudes toward the human place in the flow of nature. You see shrine in Japan, and one of the things we're going to find out about it is that it is rebuilt every 20 years, and they do not varnish or otherwise finish the wood, so that it will rot and dissolve back into the landscape. So it's part of the processes of nature, rather than resisting it. We think if we use enough steel and glass, it'll last forever and we'll be immortal. They, what, what immortality? It all flows and recycles anyway. You, know, you were born, so don't worry about it. Islam, incredible geometric material. So. 
Islam is anti-iconographic. What does that mean? No, you cannot portray human or other real images. So all the ornament is, most of the ornament is geometric. Sometimes there'll be vines, but it's, it's, it's supposed to stick with. Now there are traditions like Persian miniatures, but in general. Islamic architecture begins in the Middle East. The Middle East, we'll call from the Mesopotamian ziggurats are made out of mud brick because they do not have stone. And so the mosques are made originally out of mud brick and then the parts you see are coated with ceramic tile which is very expensive because you have to bake it in kilns and you have to burn wood to do that and wood escapes. So you just put it on the outer surface and the front and the back is left brown. So a traditional mosque being built today will mimic this and this might be brown concrete, but to, to, to mimic the look of the mud brick of the back of a traditional mosque. This is Iranian. And he's, now this is the Dome of Heaven. We'll talk about that worldview. Now, when we get to Islam, we'll take advantage of it to talk about post-colonialism. Uh, some of the other sections are going to spend more, most of the course on post-colonialism. Post-colonialism is what goes on in countries that had been European and American colonies. What, now that they're independent, what is the implication of this for their cultures. So post-colonial colonialism is theories addressing the legacy of colonial rule. Uh, it joined postmodernism as part of its critical theory in the 1970s, and Edward Said's book Orientalism is a key text. It deals with identity in the wake of colonial rule, the literature of colonial powers, just the, how the little literature of colonial powers justified colonialism by depicting the colonized as inferior and feeding the notion of binary opposition, self and other. So the Oriental is emotional, the Westerner is rational. Binary oppositional views. The key text is Edward Said's Orientalism. Said is a Christian Palestinian, taught at Columbia, and died unfortunately young just a few years ago. Studies of, uh, so Orientalism is the study of the Near and Far East by Westerners, and uh, Westerners had negative approaches to the Near and Far East, which implies a pre prejudicial attitude on the part of colonizers. So this is the themes of Said's book. And then we'll end with just a, one lecture, maybe part of a lecture on the West. And what I want to try to do is look at them from the point of view we've developed in looking at other cultures. In other words, looking at the West, at the, at the West as a culture. And so we'll see its epic poem, the Arthurian poems, the Arthurian romances and tales of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which demands an original that you follow your own path. So I'll tell you a little story. I have a very good friend, studied with for many years, Tibetan monk. I studied with Chungo Trumpa Rinpoche, who was the first Tibetan to come to the United States, and then he died, but um, uh, for some years there were the Dalai Lama's secretary, Lok Sang, was a monk in New York. I studied with him. And one of my colleagues was doing a Tibetan cultural center in New York. So Lok Sang comes to the jury. Lok Sang is the most famous Tibetan sand painter, great artist. So he brings two buddies. And there they are in their saffron and red robes, you know, looking very monk-like. 
and you know they get out of the park and the whole school's a buzz and these guys are coming into the school. They sit on the jury, they don't say very much. It's like, what the hell is going on? And I'm giving them a lift back to the city, and Lobsang says, every student does their own project? Yeah, you do someone else's project, you fail, it's called plagiarism. <laughs> well, that's not his culture. He wouldn't change a sand painting. He's not allowed to do that. Uh, so, Western culture is unique in demanding this individuality. That's in the stories of the Arthurian romances, we'll describe that. And then the idea of an individuated individual measuring nature from their point of view and the architecture giving you a zero point on the X, Y, Z coordinates from which you can survey out east, west, north, south uh, from a point of view that you can then measure things from your point of view. It's a Western idea. Then we'll do quite a bit on, we'll get through that you know, halfway through the course, and then we'll start talking about theory. What is a culture? How are they formed? Uh, how do they evolve? And we'll make some references to Oswald Spain. We won't read it. It's like a four-inch thick book, but I'll talk about it. Okay.